Getting cancer does not stop creepy guys in your DMs. Anyway. Hello, I'm Samantha, and this is my boyfriend. What's your name? Gray. <laughs> this video is going to be about how our relationship was affected by my cancer diagnosis. As a couple that's just like boyfriend, girlfriend, not engaged or not married, like we don't have any like real like, you know, commitment. Um, I mean, no, I mean like we okay. as a couple. <laughs> Let me start that again. Like, like you could have left if you wanted to is what I'm saying. Not that you like can't leave if you're married, but that'd be kind of a jerk move. You shouldn't, if you're married. <laughs> You should probably try to stay married. And sickness and health. Yeah. It's questions I've gotten a lot and questions I've seen around a lot. So that's the questions that I have written down here. And um, also some questions that I know will spark some conversation that... We may or may not include. Yeah. If you're seeing us fight on this video, if that's included, just means there was a bigger fight that we cut out. <laughs> okay. Let's get started. Let's get started. Okay, so first question. Yes. You <laughs> ready? So the first question I have is how did you tell your partner about your diagnosis? So I guess I'll start. Sure. I talked a little bit about this in my uh, first video I've made on my channel. On the day that I received my diagnosis, I got a phone call from my doctor. I was actually working from his house and he had just left to go to class. Yeah. I was on a bus to class and you texted me. I regret sending a text message because... <laughs> I, got, I got off the bus and called you. And I didn't really have very many details because the first thing that they got was, okay, cancer cells, but they didn't really have much information. So we didn't really know how serious it was. Yeah, it, in fact, it was, it was even more gradual than that because it wasn't like you, she sprung this information on me all at once because I'd been part of the process from the beginning. In fact, I was the one who kept bugging you to go to the doctor in the first place. Right, which and you so, can see in that video. Right, at first there was, they were telling you, you know, it's a cyst and they're like, oh, it's probably not, or it's an infection or it's, you know, an inflamed milk duct or some of those are probably right. the same thing, I don't really know. And then they did the first kind of biopsy where it came back and they said there were irregular cells. And I think at that atypical point- Atypical cells, yeah. Atypical cells. When the cancer diagnosis came and that, that there were cancer cells, that was only a, actually a small step up from atypical cells. Of course, I was thinking best case scenario through all of this, so I did a little research because I didn't know anything about it, and I thought it was just DCIS at first. And I'm like, okay. And then the breast surgeon tells us, no, actually it's this kind. We're like, okay, so that's gonna be this kind. Early advanced. advanced breast cancer is what they thought at first. Right. And then months later we learned about right. the rib. That's so when we learned about the there, It's like there was no single moment where it's just like all of a sudden didn't have cancer and now she has cancer and everything's completely different. It seems weird that she told me just by text, but it, it was actually... Yeah. I, it, weird as, right. as weird as this to say, it was a relatively small development. And I'm glad you told me there that I wasn't just... Because I, obviously I was worried because I knew those results were coming. My second question is, what were your initial thoughts about the diagnosis? I think we went into that. Um, yeah, again, I think... I, I think you said this a little bit, but at least my initial thoughts have always been as optimistic as possible. And sometimes that's been good because you know, it keeps me from worrying about the worst possible case. But, you know, sometimes it can keep me from thinking about some of the things that I do need to engage with, and I do need to consider other possibilities that it could be other than the best case scenario. For example, I was thinking it was DCIS, it wasn't. It was invasive. Right. And then we learned later it was stage four. And I do have to, you know, and I am, I do have to engage with those realities. The fact <laughs> that it is as bad as that and the various things that that could mean. That That's day, possible. that That March day 7th. that I learned yeah. Well, that day my Sorry. initial thoughts were, you know, okay, fine, we're going to beat this together. At that point I wanted information. I mean, right. I wanted to know how can we fix it? Can you fix it? How can you fix it? And what are the possible long-term effects? Right. Um, that initial day was very... The appointment, there was a lot of information thrown at us, but it was, it was very positive. The word cure was thrown around. Yeah a lot. They were saying, by the end of this year, before Christmas, you're going to have be done with all your treatment. Mm -hmm. I, th I would say we were hopeful after that yeah. first. I think hopeful is the right word. Okay, number three. Did you have any doubts about your relationship after the diagnosis? Do you want to start? The short and de definitive answer to that question is no. I didn't have any doubts about my relationship about Samantha because Samantha's still the same person that I fell in love with, whether she has 
stupid cells going all over her breast or not. That doesn't really change that fact. Yeah, again, when I was sitting there in that room hearing all that stuff, I wasn't worried about myself as much. Really, the main thing that went through my mind was, you know, how it was going to affect my family and everything. But more what was going through my mind was my relationship with Gray. And it's not really necessarily because, you know, I love Gray more than I love my family or anything. It's just because my family's kind of a permanent thing in my life. They have to be there with me through all of it. Like, they don't really have a choice. Gray was the person that had the choice. Um, because like I said, we were, oh gosh. And how long have we been dating? Like a year and three months or so. At the time, yeah. Yeah, that's about right. And I mean, that's a long time, but I mean, it's not, it's not that long a time. Initially after that appointment, um, just like, it was basically the first thing I said when we both got yeah. in the car. I was worried about how unfair it was to him. Yeah, so you made it clear to me that I, I did need to make the choice because it, and that I couldn't pretend it doesn't change anything. That I didn't have to go through it if I didn't want to yeah. and all that. But there was also a component that if, if I did decide that I want to be there, I did decide that I have to go through it, then you know, I, I've got to be there if you want me there as part of it. Yeah. Um, so that was the thing is that I was like, I can't have you be half in this if you're gonna be in this. His initial, initial, initial thought was, no, I'm gonna be here with you no matter what, and that's what he told me that day. And I was like, okay, I know you're telling me this now, but like, just give it some time and think about it and then come back to me on it because I now maybe won't be able to have children and maybe you want that and you don't want someone that has cancer because there's so many like serious problems that can happen with that. I went from being, you know, a perfectly healthy 22 year old to getting this cancer diagnosis and in a young relationship, that's a super big deal. If you're going through that sort of thing that you really need to have that conversation, you actually need to face the reality of it because it's not fair for him to have to stick around just because I have cancer. Like, I didn't want him to feel guilty, like, oh, now she has cancer. Like, I'm not gonna break up with her now because it's not fair for me either. Like, it's not fair for me to go through this huge, huge, big deal part of my life and for him to be half there. It's like I said earlier, you can't be optimistic without actually considering things the way they really are. And you did force me to do that. You forced me to think about both the diagnosis and our relationship and what I actually thought about those beyond my initial reactions. And so, yeah, it did it give doubts about the relationship. It gave, again, I'm not sure it gave me doubts about the relationship so much as it gave me questions I had to answer that I would not have usually answered then. then. You're gonna have to face the facts the way they actually are. Make sure you both consider things, not just through rose-colored glasses and also not through the worst case scenario, but what might happen, what's definitely gonna happen, what's not gonna happen. And I will say that we had that conversation multiple times. Three or four times, times yeah multiple times and especially it was just me a lot of times whenever something else would come up and I would get worked right up exactly and... it would be before a new treatment started or when the diagnosis changed I again felt like I was not good enough for him um... <laughs> but you are you want to take a break mm -mm. it's not a lot and we didn't have doubts like we wanted to be together, but it was kind of like, is that going to be possible sort of thing? Like there were things we needed to figure out, like we actually needed. It didn't really matter like what we wanted. It really mattered is if we well, could. What we need to think about now was not was that I'm now in a relationship with you and your cancer. <laughs> and your cancer is a bit. <laughs> Sorry, we're kind of mad, right? <laughs> How much was Gray involved in decisions like treatment and surgery? So I always came along to every doctor's appointment that I could make and learned all of that I could and asked questions when Samantha's mom didn't ask them, which is pretty much never because Samantha <laughs> has an amazing mother who asks every questions and probably has earned an honorary uh, MD at this point. <laughs> She's done so much but research. That said, I tried as much as possible not to change your treatment choices because for the same reasons we just talked about that we didn't know where the relationship was going to go exactly and I didn't want her in you know a, a few years if we'd broken up to regret a treatment choice that she'd made because of me 
And, and even if we were married at the time, I, I still would not have tried to change what you chose for treatment because you're the one who has to live with that. I don't know what any of it feels like. The treatment, the side effects, the cancer itself. I did answer her questions when she asked them and, and she would sometimes really try to prod and get my opinion when she would present herself as ambivalent on a question. But I'm not sure I ever really believed that you were totally ambivalent. That I you think I was. Really didn't I was, care between uh, options. Between the mastectomy and lumpectomy decision, right. there was a point, a really long period of time when I really just didn't. Know. I don't. I didn't know what would be the right choice for her, um, and it didn't matter really what I prefer. Even when you care what I prefer, because that wasn't the question. The question is, what do you prefer? There were other choices like the IVF. The egg freezing, which was a relatively easy decision, even though it was kind of it was kind of a hard process. It seemed like an easy decision to freeze, to, to do it, to freeze eggs. We weren't going to freeze embryos because you, if we break up, you don't want a bunch of my frozen kids lying around. That, yeah, and know, not like eggs. That would be, that would be so, weird. So <laughs> be weird. If we weren't as open with each other at we, that we, point we in our relationship. Oh, with each other. We don't have an open relationship. <laughs> if we weren't as open. Do not slide into her DMs. <laughs> By the way, that's one thing that I've learned through this process. Creepy guys don't stop showing up in your DMs. I just tell them flat out, I'm like, I have cancer. That doesn't stop them. Didn't well, stop me. Why doesn't it stop them? <laughs> I thought that that would work every single time. Has not worked. Including, Just so you know, with me. getting cancer does not stop creepy guys in your DMs. Anyway, so like she was saying, <laughs> yeah, so you might be more or less involved in the decision making process based on your relationship. I'm saying that if the boyfriend has an opinion <laughs> and the girlfriend didn't ask him for it, then you should break up the relationship <laughs> over. I don't think that you can have a good relationship through this and like keep a strong relationship through this if you're not really open with each other. I mean, can you just cut it where you say, I don't think that you can have a really strong relationship? <laughs> Sorry guys, there's no such thing. It doesn't exist. What, am I too hot? Oh. I'm trying not to look fat like I did in the boyfriend tag video. It was just not a good look for either of us. We were sitting on that couch in a weird way. The couch was really wide, so I'm slouching down a lot, so. Yeah, and your shirt kind of, like, the neck was just a little bit yeah, messed up. Wide. And, you know, I was bald and my eyebrows were, like, I had, like, two eyebrows left and, like, still three eyelashes. Just looked better than I did. What did Gray do to support you during treatment? <clears throat> well, I came to treatment was number one, when I could. When I could come to the chemo or your radiations. Uh, your mini Which is mini pretty much like all the time. Like right. he basically made himself available to do that. Your mini mini scans. I gave up a couple of he plans to come up to some things. Really big plans sometimes. You know, I, I gave her a place and time to complain and just talk about how much she felt bad. Except when you're just being totally unreasonable because you went to one place once after chemo Which... and never want to eat there again even though the food is delicious. Or something like that. Oh my god. There are two places that I can't go anymore because I went there too many times while I was on chemo. And it's a shame because they have really good food. They're, they're very good. I actually didn't think that it was as hard as I thought it was going to be. Yeah. I don't know if you agree with that. Like on our relationship? Like I was afraid that I would be angrier at things and then that would like yeah, go on to you. You were pretty great. Or that I'd be complaining about things all the time and that I would be sad about things all the time. And that's not really... It didn't really happen like it, we had days like there were days where that happened But it didn't happen very often. I would say like yeah. there weren't that many times when I was like, oh my gosh I just want to have hair again that maybe happened like once <laughs> uh, What did a hard day look like for wow, you? What a segue. And How did you get through them? I, I don't even know if it was really treatment that caused hard days. I mean, it was really just whenever we got n more news about things, I think. My biggest moments of stress with regard to a relationship have been when I'm stressing about something that I haven't told you, or that I haven't asked you, or that mm -hmm. something that I'm worried about that I haven't actually brought to your attention. But once I do, I find out it, it's either not a big deal, or I'm wrong, or you agree with me, or it's something that we can work out, you know, something along those lines. It would be when I was gone, or yeah. busy with oh school. Oh my gosh, he went on a three week long trip, two and a half week right. long. That might have been some of the To Germany. Stuff. I had a radiation appointment and we discussed all the big scary things about radiation. He had been at all the other appointments. Yeah where he, we were getting new information and that one he wasn't at. 
and it was a lot of information. It was a lot of scary stuff. You also ended chemo while I was in Germany. Yeah, because that was because unexpected. Because of your neuropathy. So I wasn't there to force you to ring the bell. <laughs> yeah. Have yeah. you posted the video of you ringing the radiation bell on the I show? posted it on Instagram. Mm. Check that out. Follow me on Instagram. I've tried to FaceTime <laughs> once a day for that whole trip, for that whole ridiculous three weeks. But the whole problem um, was that the internet connection wasn't good. So if I started to try to tell him a bunch of serious information right. and the internet kept going in and out, that was going to be super, super frustrating. So I had to wait until he got back to tell him. Sure, the treatment was hard and everything. And yeah, some days I felt awful and I felt nauseous and everything. I felt tired. And I just want to sleep all day so yeah those were my worst days mm -hmm. physically but the physical worst days are not as bad as the emotional hard days I think everybody knows that like and the best days are the ones where we overcame that a little bit and we spent time together mm -hmm. and we overcame the physical stuff and we did stuff from our normal lives hiking or going to the beach or watching a movie something beyond taking a nap and feeling sick, right? Yeah. Those were well, the best days. I could days, only, I couldn't for, do that on the bad days. Right, those, I, right yeah, those are the best days, both physically and for our relationship, where we got out and didn't let cancer turn our lives into nothing, you know? Yeah, that's an answer to the like next question. Oh, that's like, uh, how, what did you do to keep the relationship alive? Right. We tried to schedule things when we knew I was gonna be feeling well to go do fun things still and we still went on dates like we still did things we had a lot of hospital dates yeah <laughs> but that's the thing we had so many hospital dates we needed real dates too. yeah we, whatever makes your relationship strong right now that's what you should do to make your relationship strong with cancer your relationship's the same relationship and, and you're, you're the same people you should do what you love you should do what you enjoy and what you guys enjoy doing together i guess yeah, yeah. How does um, cancer treatment affect intimacy is like number one question out there. We don't have a lot of practical experience to <laughs> a offer. A lot, yeah. We don't have any practical experience <laughs> to offer on the toward the question that people are probably really trying to ask here. Right, but we do know because I mean we were told like multiple times you must use a condom <laughs> when you're on chemo and you're on radiation. It needs to be protected because you're putting poison into your body. I mean, it's yeah. not good for the other person. And yeah, the radiation can go through your body and do all sorts of things. So you're still allowed to, um, for the most part. I mean, after certain things, they don't let you. Like yeah. after the IVF surgery, you know, when they're. I imagine doing you probably wouldn't want to, though. I, I, I yeah, I would say. I, I, yeah. All this treatment and stuff is doing all kinds of things to the other person's mm -hmm. hormones, um, like to their, yeah, but not just their hormones to your skin, taste to your bones, and smell though, There's like the recovery from the surgery. And you know, I can't hug you in a certain way sometimes cause it'll hurt for a while after that. There's sometimes you'll have a hot flash from the hormone suppressants or from the chemo. It affects cuddling cause mm -hmm. of hot flashes. Like, you can't just sit there and be warm and under a blanket for like more than 15 minutes anymore because I'm gonna get a hot flash and it is the most miserable thing ever. The fatigue and the nausea in the chemo had this general effect too. Sometimes if you felt nauseous, you didn't really wanna kiss me a bunch or you could become more you know, susceptible to my bad breath, for example, and you know, right. or you could use it as an excuse and you could just be like, no, it's not you, it's the chemo, but it was probably me. No. <laughs> I, that was a big thing. Right, that right. was a big thing. Um, I felt nauseous on chemo. I was, my smell, sense of smell was increased. Like I did not want to kiss him some days. Like I just didn't. And I felt really bad about it. I didn't, I didn't really want to like associate kissing him with feeling nauseous. I think that's pretty understandable. It's a thing that's not talked about a lot, but I think it's starting to be talked about more. I see that show up a lot on people's Instagram feeds. Like, people don't talk about this very openly, but it's a big deal. So, there's that. What was it like to go through so many changes in appearance? Slash, what was it like for you to watch? Why don't you start on that one since you're the one who went through? I'm not really someone that cares that much about my appearance, but I'm not gonna lie and say that I don't because, I mean, everybody does. Things I cared about mainly were getting attention that I didn't want. I mean, obviously I didn't care about the attention enough to get a wig because I didn't want to deal with that. 
but that was that was a big problem for me it was in public just getting stopped by people and asking about my health uh, when I didn't really want to be asked about that by random strangers I was worried about what he would say and what he would think not really what he would say because I knew he was going to tell me that I was pretty no matter what but I didn't know if he actually would mean it mm. and I was afraid that I would be able to tell when he looks at me I <laughs> I feel like I'm the prettiest person in the entire world and I didn't think he'd be able to fake that. I know he could tell me that I was, but I, that if he didn't look at me like that, then I would know that I wasn't, you know, enough for him anymore and I had that completely irrational fear, but it's not, it's dumb because it's not why he looks at me like that. <laughs> And I knew that I definitely still love her because she's still Samantha, but I was worried, was it going to change anything? Was it going to make me less attracted to you? And it didn't. Every change, every single change of her hair, and that includes when it was cut to shoulder length, when it was buzz cut, when it fell out in patches, and, and when it was shaved, eyebrows were when your gone. eyebrows came off, when it came back in in patches, um, and then when you cut it again to get it cleaner, and then when it grew to its length now, it didn't change anything. In fact, I thought every change looked even better than the last. When it was going out and when it was coming in, which didn't make any sense, but it's like looking at an old photo of somebody who now has a beard or doesn't have a beard, and now they look weird in that photo, but they look normal to you. Because Samantha looks like Samantha to me, no matter what her hair looks like. And I would look back at an old picture of her with hair down to the middle of her back and think, well, that she looks weird in that photo, <laughs> but she looks great here, and she'd be totally bald, or her hair would be falling out in patches. And... I was shocked to find that it didn't affect me at all. She was the most beautiful person in the world to me, um, and I can honestly say that, with any length of hair. And an old picture would look weird. I look back on her pictures of her bald now, and I think she looks kind of weird in the pictures, bald. Yeah, I because you have hair. I'm like, wow, I but look weird. But when you were bald, you didn't look weird. Not at all. Not yeah. a bit. Um, and, and so, I don't know, it didn't affect me. I thought, you know, when your girlfriend does something different with her hair, it always is kind of new and fun and exciting. and even when it was something so drastic, that was still the case. So. Yeah. yeah. So. She also thinks her breasts are uneven now, but I don't think so, and I can't tell. <laughs> They're slightly uneven. They're not like super uneven, and yeah. it's it's like kind of like not filled in as much as the other one is. So that was really supportive, though, of you to always like say those things. Obviously. Yeah, and, and I was. <laughs> And there was a small part. Of me, there was a small serious. part of me that worried I'd have to just say those things and would just be kind of waiting and holding on until her hair grew back. And it wasn't like that at all. Yeah. I didn't have to fake it. What were the hardest parts of the whole thing? I, we already discussed that. We talked about what a bad day was. The hardest parts were when we communicated poorly or not at all or weren't with each other. And sometimes I felt a little guilty going on a vacation with my family and you know doing these kind of things that we've planned for before. Oh, but, but it, yeah, you had that great. trip you, planned. You didn't make me put my life on hold for this. And I tried to respect that and do as much as I could with you and stuff without completely changing. Uh, and obviously it has completely changed my life, but it, without making everything about this. Because like I said, you have to do your normal things. And sometimes that's your normal things just by yourself or the things that you had planned. We worked so hard to go to Disney World because we were going to do that. We weren't going to let cancer rob us of our trip to Disney World. And we had that plan before. And we had that plan before. Right. And so it was things like that where they sometimes made it a little harder. And I, I changed the plans when, I, when they were, it was absolutely necessary to do so and when it was really going to affect our relationship or the treatment. I didn't do the things that I planned. But where I could, together and even apart, it's necessary to, you know, show cancer who's boss and live your life like you were going to live your life where you can. And I wanted him to. I right. wanted him to. And, and you were very clear about that. And, and I, I, I think I was very clear to you that if... I needed to, I wasn't going to go on that trip and things like that. And plus, I mean, I had other people to be there for me. Yeah. Like, it's not like Gray's the only person I had in my life. I mean, yeah, maybe if... You got your other boyfriend. Yeah. Trey. I never went to chemo alone, basically. Yeah. I never did. Yeah, you never did. Not once, yeah. right? Um, how has your relationship changed since getting the cancer diagnosis? I think it's gotten stronger. Yeah. And it's That's gotten sure. stronger with time because relationships always get stronger with time, but I think it sped up a lot of things. Right. I think it made it stronger faster than it otherwise would have. Yeah, I don't think that this cancer did anything to our relationship that wouldn't have already happened. I don't think it made us have conversations that we wouldn't have had down the road. 
or well, it definitely, it definitely did. Well, yes, but <laughs> okay, with regards to the cancer specifically, but yeah. there are other conversations it made us have too, uh, which are conversations we would have had anyway, and things we would have talked about, and eventually we would have figured out how do we handle hard things together, um, can we? Hard things. I together. know that's that was the the, the <laughs> UVA football motto that year that they <laughs> were terrible. But how would we handle things like that? Uh, and it tested our relationship faster than we would have ordinarily undergone a test like that. I didn't want it to change the relationship into a, a, to completely reframe it as something that it's not. Or I guess that's a bad word, but I, I yeah. I'm not going to break up with Samantha just because she has cancer, and I'm not going to marry her just because she has cancer. I'd say ultimately it didn't. This is our. This is the same relationship. It is the same fundamental relationship between the same fundamental people based on the same things. Um, yeah. It added components to it, but it didn't. It, it's the same relationship that it always was. If you're with the right person, a cancer diagnosis isn't going to hurt your relationship. Like that's not something that will be. But don't let the whole relationship be built on the cancer either. That's, right. that's the other thing. That's that's the balance you have to do is recognize the cancer, deal with it as it is, yeah. actually looking at the facts, but don't base the entire relationship or make really big, long-term decisions only based on the cancer either, because the person's still there mm -hmm. under all that cancer. <laughs> what will be the biggest challenges going forward? But continuing treatment. Um, there, there will be the side effects of the treatment going forward, basically. You won't be able to have kids for the time that you're on the oral chemo and the hormone blockers, which they want to do for at least five years. There's always the chance the cancer could come back, uh, at which point you would probably never have kids and you'd be on, you'd go through this kind of treatment again. Uh, and that's, you know, that's a scary thought that's always there. Mm -hmm. uh, so is just the general, there's that. the the what ifs, and then there's the definitely things, the, the, the things that will definitely happen. Like, you will have hot flashes probably for a long time. Uh, you will have, you'll be more fatigued than than you might otherwise be. And I don't, I don't definitely. Wanna, don't wanna list off, <laughs> make you feel bad by listing off all your side effects here, but there are things, yeah. there's treatment that you're definitely gonna have for at least five years that has side effects. Um, and you know, it's, we're still going to have to be dealing with those. I mean, so far we've dealt with them, but we've dealt with them over a short period of time and they've been, I mean, they've been more severe than they're going to be, but they're going to be still things yeah. over a long period of time. The, the parts that are the new normal are scarier to me than the parts that are the scary, you know, maybes. And it's going to affect decisions that we're going to make. It's going to make, it's going to affect a lot of things. So kind of dealing with that, balancing that, not making the relationship just about cancer. Mm -hmm. um, all those things are probably going to be the biggest challenges going forward. But I think that if we've gotten this far, then it's looking pretty good. No, that's it. It's over. Oh, I didn't want to tell you this. <laughs> Can you cut the video right there? <laughs> and then like go to the, the, the credits? Thanks for watching! <laughs> If you want to see a more fun version of us hanging out, watch the boyfriend tag video. We hope you enjoyed watching this. I think the big takeaways are you need to be honest about what cancer actually means and listen to what the doctors say, but don't make the relationship all about that and there's still definitely room for, for hope and joy. If this video gets up in time, have a Merry Christmas. If not, have a Happy New Year. And if Samantha's really bad at editing, Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> Because we still have to watch it and be like, do we actually want to put this on the internet? I trust you. I don't feel like I've said anything that I really regret in there. Okay. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for watching. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you think it'll help somebody, send it to them. And subscribe to my channel to follow along more with my cancer adventures. And follow me on Instagram if you want more detailed updates. Yeah. Yeah. That's Keep all. Up.